Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Rayburn, a lecturer in nonfiction writing here. Uh, thanks for coming out for our new Voices series in nonfiction. And uh, we're here tonight uh, to listen to Jeff Hobbs. So uh, by way of introduction to Jeff, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Studs Terkel first, since we're on Studs Terkel's home turf. Uh, I've always remembered the preface to Studd's book of oral history about race relations in Chicago. Uh, the book Race, the epigraph for the book, comes from a woman here in Chicago named Lucy Jefferson who said, there's such a thing as a feeling tone, and if you don't have one, baby, you've had it. And I think he chose that uh, for his book of oral histories about Chicago and about race relations because uh, he was basically pointing out his job, which is to be a listener. And Lucy Jefferson uh, was talking about the importance of being a good listener. And I think that's just a crucial skill, not only for us as aspiring writers and readers, um, but just for being human beings. And I think that's really the defining quality of what I love so much about Jeff's second book, The Short and Tragic Life of Robert, Robert Peace. Uh, it's one man's story, but it's also a really complex and reconfigured sort of oral history. It's about one man, Robert Peace, but it's also about the voices of everybody who knew him. In many ways, you know, Jeff is the author and the narrator, but he's really a conduit for almost like a chorus of voices. Um, and Rob Peace is sort of the, he's sort of the mystery at the center. Every, uh, you know, the book is about the voices of everybody who surrounded him and who were drawn to him and to his charisma and to his intelligence and to ultimately the, the fact that he was a mystery and he is sort of the, the whole at the center of that story, uh, or those stories, plural. Jeff got about 180 hours of tape of interviews, which he lovingly transcribed and edited and built uh, like an architect. He structured those, those interviews uh, guided by this, this feeling tone uh, into this you know, relatively short and tragic 400-page story. There are 400 pages that paint a portrait, not only of Rob's life, but ultimately I think of life in general. Our country and our culture, our many different cultures, uh, Newark, Yale, and m many places in between uh, and around the world. It's a portrait that doesn't give us any answers. Uh, one of the things I admire most about Jeff's book is the way that he condenses one man's life, but he doesn't make the mistake of reducing it. It is a story and it is a narrative, but it's not a story or a narrative that we've heard before. It's not a stereotype, it's much larger than that. And somehow in the, in the act of compressing all these stories that he got from different people who knew Rob Peace, he, he sort of enlarges that life and, and Rob and, and asks, I think with great empathy, uh, with that feeling tone, the reader to consider a lot of paradoxes. One of them is how could Rob Peace have been so smart a molecular biology major at Yale, um, and yet how could he have been so dumb as to do what he did? And how could he have stayed true to his roots in Newark, where he came from, but still have escaped it, you know, which he didn't, ultimately? And how could the things that made him a, a great man, his loyalty primarily to his family and to his friends, and his generosity, and his, his almost total selflessness, uh, how could those great qualities also be some of the qualities that ultimately did him in and th that got him killed? And there aren't any answers to these questions, and that's one of the things I admire most about this book, is that it raises them, uh, along with the implicit and implied message, for lack of a better word, that, that maybe all we can do is to listen. And so that's what we're here to do, to listen to Jeff Hobbs. So please join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. That means an awful lot. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. It, it is raining outside. I live in Los Angeles. I haven't seen rain for a very long time, um, and I really appreciate it. And second thing is, I'm, I'm sorry, I've been going around apologizing all day for this bandage on my face. I play in a flag football league of over-the-hill has-beens, and uh, on every team there's someone who doesn't understand that he's over the hill. 
um, and thinks he's Calvin Johnson, and, and I took an elbow from, a, from that guy. I'm not going to read, just, just maybe give a primer for what I hope will be a conversation. Uh, again, I'm just very thankful for you all coming out, and, and it is really a privilege to speak to anybody about Rob Peace, uh, but particularly students and, uh, and teachers. He was a very special student and also a fine teacher. Uh, Rob was my uh, uh, college roommate for four years, uh, best friend during those years. Uh, he bailed me out of fist fights like the time I was unfortunately hired as a bouncer for the Yale uh, Symphony Orchestra's Halloween concert. Um, it tells you a lot about Yale that they required a bouncer. It's, things went south for me. Uh, he talked to me about heartbreak uh, and girls, which was good because I didn't know much about girls and still don't, even though I've been married to one for 10 years. But mostly, you know, we sat around and talked about football and music and, and life a little bit. Uh, later on, he was a groomsman in my wedding. And after that, uh, we lived on different coasts and maybe talked on the phone uh, four or five times a year. Uh, again, not about too much just because we are guys. You know, it seemed like we made the effort to have the conversations and they were genuine and, and uh, life was long and there would always be time for a reunion. Um, but there wasn't. Uh, about five years ago, Rob was shot twice and, and killed by men in ski masks. This happened in a basement surrounded by marijuana about a mile from the house he grew up in. And I could tell you a little bit about how and where he grew up in a neighborhood outside Newark, New Jersey, nicknamed Ill Town. His mother worked very long hours for, for not much money, mostly in hospital and nursing home kitchens. Um, his dad was arrested and later convicted for a double murder when Rob was seven years old. That didn't stop him from using prison phones to go over his son's homework and uh, uh, talk about penmanship. Uh, you know, Rob playing football in the street with his friends was not witnessing violence and being confronted every day, but uh, uh, they knew that on any day it could happen and, and, you know, had their head on a swivel, as, as Rob used to say. Um, he called this Newark proofing himself. But it, it was also a neighborhood where families like the pieces uh, had owned homes for two, three generations before redlining and uh, freeway construction and uh, manufacturing decline, uh, riots and, and racism did the things they, they do. As almost everyone I spoke to who grew up there said at some point, it was not Disneyland, but, but it was home. Uh, I, I met Rob first day freshman year. We were randomly paired as roommates, uh, had an awkward head nod, hand slap uh, in an unfurnished room. Uh, do you know where we get some food? Uh, at the time, I, I just knew that he had gone to prep school and he played water polo and he liked hiking the Appalachian Trail. So I assumed that aside from being black, he, he was a pretty typical Yale student and uh, a progressive person might argue if there is such a thing. Uh, I would say there definitely is and you are looking at one here. Uh, Rob was not typical and not just uh, because um, of where he grew up, but because he was an A student in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, which is about as easy as it sounds. Um, he, he was captain of the water polo team for two years. Uh, initiation had him wearing a toga in the dining hall singing Madonna's Express Yourself, uh, which I was not there for, but, but I heard he really brought it. Um, he was in one of those secret societies. Uh, he had sort of a group of girls basically on call to come rebraid his cornrows uh, whenever he needed. It, it took about two or three hours. He smoked a lot of marijuana and, and he sold a lot of marijuana out of the room. He wasn't quiet about it. It seemed like he uh, never spent any money on himself and he must have been saving up for grad school or, or just building a, a safety net that he'd never had. and. Uh, uh, since it was marijuana and we lived in a college dorm, it, it seemed safe. And uh, every night he hung up the phone with his mother and said the words, you're my heart, uh, none of which uh, is, is typical. 
uh, for a Yaley or any student, uh, I think. Uh, at the time, I was pretty glad to have a black roommate. I consider myself pretty savvy when it came to black culture. Uh, this was because I ran track. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, spent a lot of my teenage years, summers in, in vans and uh, cheap hotels with, with my teammates. Uh, taught me how to play spades. We, we listened to music, and they called me an honorary black man. I thought I was down. Uh, and Rob, <laughs> Rob never clued me in. Otherwise, I think more out of amusement than, than anything else. But it is painful when you're my age to learn how ignorant you were uh, as a as kid, uh, painful, also very valuable. I also consider myself very aware. I always wanted to be a writer and thought I paid attention to big and small things. Uh, I was aware of most of what I have mentioned so far. Um, what I was not aware of was a, a huge and complicated set of discomforts Rob experienced at Yale, uh, how to reconcile the gratitude uh, for this gift of a, an Ivy League education. It was actually a gift, a, a rich white banker alum of his high school uh, heard a speech he gave and offered to pay his tuition on the spot. Uh, how to reconcile that with, with uh, resentment of, of uh, blithely affluent classmates like me. Uh, how to manage the guilt, knowing his mother was home. She cried every night the first three months he was away. Uh, she was alone in that house for the first time since he was born. Uh, guilt for high school friends, also very bright, uh, who, who couldn't go to college for financial or other reasons. And, and also the vitriol that, that a dangerous few people back home uh, sort of targeted him with. Since he had chosen to go to Yale, it must mean he thought he was better than them. I had to ask for help without admitting that he needed it. Uh, and, and I risk here painting this picture of a sort of a brooding Hamlet figure trudging around, scowling at people. But uh, I thought that was not Rob. He was a very bright, uh, popular. He had a high-pitched laugh. He laughed all the time. Not everyone liked him because he had loud opinions. And uh, you know, if you thought you were wrong or just being an idiot, he, he would let you know it. And that was not fun. Uh, but he, he would also tell you if he was proud of you. Uh, which is pretty rare for a man, particularly a young man. Uh, and he made fantastic friendships at Yale, lifelong friendships, and he took those with him. Uh, any friction he dealt with, he dealt with it uh, invisibly and alone. And he took that with him too. Because uh, we didn't see it when we watched him receive his diploma in the spring of 2002, he seemed uh, you know, maybe not just destined but chosen to fulfill all of his dreams and, and a lot of dreams that other people had for him. Uh, and he, he, he accomplished a lot, but uh, about nine years later, I was brushing my teeth next to my wife and uh, phone dinged and I learned that he had died violently, painfully, and, and uh, very pointlessly. Uh, and about six months after that, I, I found myself sitting in his mother's living room on Chapman Street, uh, talking about telling his story in, in some form. I, I was there because of the funeral where, uh, you know, alongside a towering grief, a, a very particular kind of grief I'd never experienced before. And, and if any of you have, uh, I'm sorry. But it's kind of underneath that, uh, as that day wore on, people just told stories, uh, most of them uh, really funny and, and even joyous stories. Uh, it, it was kind of a celebration. And, and we all went home and, and people just kept telling stories on, on the phone, on Facebook and, and in person. People just didn't want to let him go. Uh, and at a certain point, I, I sort of foolishly volunteered to make a compilation of these stories, maybe like a, a piece for the Yale Alumni Magazine, uh, just something that uh, was more meaningful than a news article that just took Yale drugs murder uh, and left it there. Uh, and people were sort of more enthusiastic that, than I expected, uh, which is how I reached out to Jackie Peace and um, visited her, uh, expecting to meet a still shattered woman. I, I was really nervous uh, just at the thought of 
causing her more pain, which, which of course I, I did. Uh, but out outwardly, she was not. She was very gracious. She, she smiled a lot. She laughed a few times. Uh, I was pretty upfront about challenges, uh, uncertainties of e even a, a little piece. Uh, the fact that uh, I, I sure didn't know what I was doing. The um, fact that we would learn things she didn't know and wouldn't want to know about her son. The fact that I, I look the way I look. I asked if she was comfortable with that. and. That was one of the times she laughed. She said, I'm sitting here, I, I see the way you look. And she didn't even think about it that, that long. Uh, she said, that'd be, that'd be nice, sure. And uh, I think she was just moved that people still cared. Uh, and so for the next, what turned out to be three and a half years, that, that's what I did or tried to do. I uh, mostly sat on people's, in their cars, their, their kitchens, their offices, front stoops. Uh, just sharing stories, also their drug dens. Uh, uh, again, not knowing what I was doing, it was clumsy, it, it was comical, it was uh, cathartic, harrowing, dangerous, once or twice. Uh, mostly like the funeral, it, it was just very kind of joyous and very, very sad. Um, and I learned the story of his life, I learned about uh, cities and their challenges, I learned about uh, education and access and entitlement, identity and, and things that shape it, uh, a lot about race. Uh, as I said, it's really painful to, to learn how ignorant you are, and it's also really valuable uh, to have authentic conversations where we should be having them. Uh, Rob believed in authenticity more than just about anything. Uh, he. Uh, paid a lot of attention to that, the way we all project different versions of ourselves according to the environment that we're in, school, work, dinner with your in-laws, uh, the way we all tweak our narratives just, just to fit in a little better. He, he called this fronting. It really aided him, especially when he had to do it himself. And, and uh, of course he did, and, and I'm doing it right now, uh, acting like I belong up here. Uh, for, for better, for worse. And, and since we're at the University of Chicago, w which looks a lot like Yale, I guess I'll just speak for a moment about his transition to Yale, transitioning from a uh, high school that was 90% black and Latino to a university that was, you know, not 90% white, but it, it looks that way when you're walking around a, a high school that took an almost authoritarian control over what they saw as the student's most valuable asset, which is their time, uh, to a university where, uh, you know, time is all yours. You know, Yale researching there, they, they were more guarded than any drug dealer uh, in, in Newark, New Jersey, uh, which was really irritating, though, though I, I understood their anxiety. But w one thing I learned at Yale had to do with a very tricky word, help. Again, I had to ask for help without admitting that you need it. Um, and I learned that Yale, you know, Chicago, uh, any university, mo most any high school. I was at Gwendolyn Brooks down on 111th Street uh, this morning. Uh, there's an infrastructure to help uh, anyone who could use it. Uh, there's writing tutors, uh, counselors, career services, and, and it's all there and, and it's free if you ask. I guess it's not free, it's included in tuition. And, and I learned that the students by far more likely to ask are the affluent kids, the boarding schoolers looking to turn an A minus into an A, uh, the students who from the first day of their lives were geared to believe that ad adults exist to help them. And I'm not, not knocking that perspective here. Uh, it's sort of the last time in your life you will be surrounded by adults who's whose life purpose is to help you. So uh, it's very nice if you could let them fulfill their, their life purpose. <laughs> that makes them feel good. But uh, you know, a guy like Rob, and I'm not psychoanalyzing him here, uh, you know, he, he expressed this. Uh, he had to see himself as a functioning adult from age seven, uh, and he saw just the act of asking, even the simplest kind of asking, like, like sitting down with a friend and letting them listen as an expression of weakness and maybe a source of shame. 
Um, and, and I'm not suggesting that, that Rob or, or anybody who feels out of place needs quote unquote help. Again, it's a, it's a tricky word. You know, I, I spoke to dozens of, of former classmates who maybe shared some thread with Rob's upbringing, uh, whether that's money or a fractured family or uh, just the stress of uh, the city. And they're all living uh, what you'll call successful lives. Uh, success is another tricky word. Um, they, they have families and they own homes and they have jobs they like. Uh, every single one of these people, uh, once the topic came up through Rob, uh, began to express this raw and powerful trauma of isolation that, that still trails them uh, now almost uh, 15 years uh, after we graduated. Um, and I was friends with a lot of these people, people who, who cried in front of me. And back then I had no idea. Uh, the reason for that was because they didn't want me to have any idea because if I did, uh, it might signal that they didn't belong. Uh, and of course, they belonged. Um, in, in the meantime, nobody, you know, shows up at, at first day of college thinking they're, they're going to make someone feel like they don't belong. Um, may, I mean, maybe a, a couple people do, but there are always going to be a couple jerks nearby. Key is not to pay attention and not be contaminated by them, but uh, it happens. It happens in these, these subtle or not so subtle, uh, I think, unintentional ways. Uh, the first couple days of college, I'm certain that uh, uh, at some point I compared our dorm room to a prison cell, just because just the rooms were, were not that big. Uh, and a lot of people were, were saying that and laughing. No idea that, that the guy unpacking in that room across from me, uh, his father lived in a prison cell. Today, this would be called a microaggression. Uh, I would also call it just being a, a moron. Um, <laughs> and Rob, I can imagine what was going through his head uh, at the time, and I'm sure it wasn't kind, but, uh, but he, uh, he took it very easy on me and, and allowed me to be his friend. And, and I think he understood better than most that we all don't experience each moment in the same way. Um, Rob's sort of mantra was, I'm all good, it's all good. Uh, I'm all good, and uh, and he projected that. Uh, it was easy to uh, to believe that, e even when once in a while a circumstance belied the claim. And you know, I and a lot of people carry a lot of guilt thinking back to so many dorm room conversations and dining hall conversations. Where if uh, if you know, say I'd been less distracted by by an English paper or a track meet uh, uh, or, or girls uh, again, if I just you know, listened closer and maybe asked a, uh, uh, a harder question or the kind of question that's safer to avoid asking. I, I couldn't have changed anything, but uh, at least I would have known him better uh, and he would have known that I wanted to. The reason I didn't was because it, it might have been uncomfortable. Uh, we don't like to be uncomfortable and, and one thing I've learned the last couple of years is that it is okay to be uncomfortable. It's really necessary. Um, and it's easy to think if, uh, if a lot of people had sort of undertaken that effort and assumed the discomfort and the vulnerability to just know him better, that he might still be around. There, there's no way to know. There's no sort of answers in this story. There, there's no gauge that measures the value of empathy when it comes to living and dying. People get mad at me about this uh, sometimes. Uh, they want me to blame Yale, blame his father, blame, uh, blame his neighborhood, blame drugs, uh, blame racism, or just blame Rob. Most people want me to just blame Rob. And of course, personal accountability matters. But, you know, Rob was smart enough to know better. Uh, he made some very bad decisions, objectively bad decisions. He was smart enough to know he uh, had a lot less margin than, than most people margin for error. Uh, he was also loving enough to know the impact it would have on his family and his friends if, if uh, anything ever happened to him. But underneath all that, that there's just this guy, uh, special, complicated, flawed guy living his life, making decisions day to day, mostly innocuous decisions. Uh, 
maybe trying to make sense of the world as it, as it unfolded, uh, maybe trying to cling to his vision for how he wanted to inhabit that world. Um, and you can sort of label that vision how you want. Uh, I would call it a romantic vision. You know, you, you guys read a lot of books and, and I'm sure a number of you have been in love and, and you know that romance is, is, is vital. Uh, romance is, is the fuel, but it also causes warped logic and, and invisible burdens and uh, impossible loyalties and, and it doesn't always end well. The, uh, the first time, that first time I sat down with his mother, you know, we talked about a lot. One thing she said was that uh, her only consolation since losing her only son was that she knew he had influenced uh, a lot of people. She thought for the better, and I think she's right. So she thought it would be nice if he, if he continues to do that. Last fall, I was at a, uh, a high school in southeastern D.C. Uh, again, just, just uh, giving a little talk and, and having a conversation, and, and a young man, we were in the library, about 25 kids, boys and girls, uh, and a young man, uh, maybe 16, said, uh, was saying how there's sort of the, the part of himself that he can make accessible to, to the world, to his teachers, his neighbors, uh, just people. Uh, there's a smaller part of himself that uh, the experience he shared with his mother, um, that was for her. Uh, there was a smaller part that, that was just for his friends. And that uh, then there was this little box, he said, that was just sort of locked uh, in his chest. And, and he didn't know why it was there. He didn't know why it was locked. Uh, and, and he said he didn't even know that it was there uh, until he sort of met, met Rob through uh, reading this book. And so, so there's this other unanswerable question, which is how would Rob sort of feel about all this? Uh, he was a very private person. I think he'd be pretty pissed at me for, for a minute and, and then maybe hearing uh, that guy talk about that box, uh, I think Rob would be uh, very glad about it. Um, anyway, thank you uh, very much. Uh,